Okay, today I'm outside the Tower of London. I wasn't originally planning on doing a video about uh, the Tower of London because there's so many out there already. But I figured why not I'll throw mine in the mix as well. Uh, so I'm on the back side. The opposite side of this, uh, where we are right now, is the side that faces the River Thames. And I guess that would be considered the front. So if that's the case, this is the back. Now that big grassy area you see around it, that was originally a, a moat and that was filled with water at one time, but you know, they've since drained it. And it's a grassy area now. now to the left uh, would be Tower Hill and to the right uh, would be uh, towards the city of London. Now this is the side if you buy tickets to go in, uh, you would enter from this direction here. You'd buy your tickets off to the right of where we are right now, then you'd enter through that uh, gate right there and off to the left inside the, the tower. Right over here, they've got some neat uh, sculptures of various animals. So you'll see uh, some lions here. And, uh, a little bit of everything uh, scattered around in, in this area. And what that represents was the time frame that uh, uh, it was almost like a zoo before the London Zoo was uh, created. Visiting dignitaries would drop off an exotic pet from their country and suddenly uh, the, the crown had a collection of these exotic animals. That way, that there is the inner defensive wall. It goes back to around about 1220. So it's a very, very old wall. Follow it down to the left. Follow it all the way down and stop when you get to all those windows. Very briefly, those windows, that's the back of the Queen Cat. Not going to tell you much about that because we are going to have a much better view of that building once we get through there. I do actually need to speak about the tower at the bottom there though. It's called the Bell Tower. It's called the Bell Tower because of that small white box on top that contains the oldest surviving curfew bell in London. It dates back to 1651. More importantly though, inside that tower are two circular chambers, one on top of the other. Now, those chambers are quite unique in that there is no staircase inside that tower connecting those chambers. Access can only be gained by going through the residence of the constable of the tower, what we call the Queen's House. And that's why it was such an important prison to us here at the Tower of London. It is believed that Queen Elizabeth I was held here as a princess for eight weeks by her half-sister Mary. For Mary had reason to believe that Elizabeth was involved in the Sir Thomas Wyatt Rebellion against the Queen's plans to marry Philip of Spain. Fortunately, Elizabeth was proved innocent, but she was still banished for nearly a year to Woodstock Palace near Oxford. But she would return to the Tower within four years to prepare for her very own coronation. <coughs> But that would be the last time she would visit the tower in her long reign of nearly 45 years. And lastly, St. Thomas More and St. John Fisher were held in both of those chambers. Now, these were two men who failed to sign up to the Church of England under King Henry VIII. And eventually, after around about 15 months, King Henry, he lost patience and he sent them both up to Tower Hill where they were both publicly beheaded. 400 years later in 1935 both of those men were canonized as saints of the Roman Catholic faith and they are now laid to rest in the crypt of our chapel and I shall point that out later in the tour. <laughs> so we've just walked down Water Lane. Why Water Lane? Well, because up until 1275, the River Thames splashed against the inner defensive wall. It wasn't until this outer wall was completed, around about 1280, that this roadway, roadway was raised some 12 feet, became known as Water Lane. And this is the way we have walked to get to here. Probably one of the most famous, or should I say, infamous gates 
in the world. Traitors Gate, built on the orders of Edward I. It required a more safer and useful entrance into the tower. It is I'd rather use the narrow, winding streets of London where convoys could be attacked. Stores stolen, prisoners set free. He would use the River Thames as a highway instead. So he had a hole knocked into the air defensive wall and a gate fitted so that a high tide boats could come through the gate and unload their cargo in safety. The gate was originally known as the Water Gate. Any Americans here? <laughs> <laughs> we had it first. <laughs> had less leaks, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Having reached the air defence wall, he realised it was a weakened defence of the premier fortress in the land. So he commanded that a tower be built above the gate to protect it. The tower was named in honour of a former constable of the tower, St Thomas of Becket, Archbishop of Canterbury, murdered on the steps of Canterbury Cathedral in 1170. And the orders, Edward's great-grandfather, King Henry II, for going back to the gate. Like I said, it was originally known as the Watergate. So how then did it become known as Traitor's Gate? Well, this occurred during the Tudor period, when a large number of alleged traitors entered this fortress through those grim gates. Among them, we say no less than three queens of England, Queen Anne Boleyn, Queen Catherine Howard, and Lady Jane Grey, the uncrowned queen of only nine days. High dignitaries of the church were no exception either. Archbishop Cramner, Bishops Latimer and Ridley were all brought into the Tower of London through those gates during the reign of Queen Mary Tudor, or Bloody Mary. Now these three pious men were then taken to Oxford, where they were burnt at the stake for heresy. Those and many more unfortunate souls would have made that journey down the River Thames from their place of trial at London's Guildhall or the Palace of Westminster. And they would come through those gates. They would land at these steps to be met by the yeoman jailer and an escort of handsome the Yeoman Warders, more of a response girl, <laughs> <laughs> to be taken through the large way there to their cell or dungeon. And there they would wait for whatever fate had in store for them. And for many, it was a short journey to outside the tower to their place of execution. Let's look this way at the Wakefield Tower. At a later stage of the War of the Roses, it was alleged that King Henry VI was murdered in the upper chamber of this tower on the 21st of May, 1471, being stabbed to death whilst at prayer. An immediate adjacent, no longer connected to the Wakefield Tower, stands the infamous Bloody Tower. Originally known as the Garden Tower because it overlooked and it gave access to the Lieutenant's Garden on the other side of that wall. It was renamed the Tower of Blood or the Bloody Tower during the reign of Queen Elizabeth I. Commemorate the many tragedies that had occurred within. And of all the tragedies, surely the most tragic must be the alleged murder of the two boy princes in 1483, King Edward V and his younger brother Richard, the Duke of York. They were aged just 12 and 9, were allegedly smothered to death whilst living in the Bloody Tower under the protection of their uncle, Richard, the Duke of Gloucester. And shortly after their disappearance, he became King Richard III. Now it was written by Sir Thomas More that their tiny bodies were bundled down some steps leading into the Wakefield Tower, hastily buried under some stones. But the following morning they were removed by an unknown priest who buried them in a secret plot under some stairs on this side of the White Tower. And there they remained for 191 years until workmen during the reign of King Charles II, 
they came across a chest. And I'm looking inside this chest. It wasn't gold or silver that they were hoping for, but it was the remains of two small male bodies. And the experts of the day did declare that they were indeed those two missing princes. And so on the orders of the king, they were taken to Westminster Abbey. They were reinterred in Innocent's Corner. And that's where they remain to this day. Now the famous navigator, Sir Walter Raleigh, he spent nearly 13 years of his life confined in the bloody tower. 13 years of his life imprisoned in that one room in the bloody tower. And during that 13 years, he was tortured nearly every single day. For all of that 13 years, they let his wife stay in there with him. Oh. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> green is the village green of the Tower of London. But unlike most village greens in England, we have something very unique on ours, our very own execution site. <laughs> now you see the small glass monument there? That's not to be mistaken for the public execution site out up on Tower Hill. Actually, very few people were executed within these walls. Six on proper built scaffold. But three of those six, they were queens of England. And I'm going to tell you about them, but before I do, I quickly need to tell you about some of the buildings that surround us. So let's all look that way. You can see the entrance to the bloody tower. Now, I'd already said about that, so I won't I'll go on about it, but the entrance is just down that way, just behind that tree on the left-hand side. We'll move on to the right there. You see the building in the corner? I said we'd have a much better view of it, and there it is. It's what we call the Queen's House. Well, the Queen's House in name only really stands on the side of a much older building that served as the lieutenant's lodgings. However, due to complaints from Sir Edmund Walsingham during the reign of King Henry VIII, it was agreed to advance the sum of money required for rebuilding. And what we see here is the result a perfectly preserved Tudor residence that still serves as the home to the constable of the tower and his family but not just a home to important officials. Some very important prisoners were held in this house. It is believed that Queen Catherine Howard, fifth wife of Henry VIII, was held here prior to her execution. William Penn was another famous prisoner held on the top floor of the Queen's house for his offensive writing. I know. And one of the last prisoners of the tower was Rudolf Hess. Deputy leader of Nazi Germany. He was held on the first floor of the Queen's House for four days in May 1941, then taken deeper into the country, pretty much for his own protection, until the end of the war. He was returned to Berlin, Spandau Prison, and he was to see out the rest of his days there. That tower in front of you, that's the Beecham Tower. Now, when you've had a chance to look in the lower level of this tower, feel free to climb the internal spiral stairs to the state prison room behind that tall arched window. Inside there you will find some notable inscriptions carved into the walls by some of its prisoners. Some of these are nearly 500 years old. Moving to the right, we have the residence of our tower doctor. Next door to the doctor lives the tower chaplain. So if he doesn't fix us, he buries us. <laughs> <laughs> so organised. I love this job. <laughs> and that's the chapel there, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not going to say anything about that, because we're going to go in there in a short while. The Waterloo Block. Stands on the side of the grand storehouse that was destroyed by fire in 1841. This building was erected in 1845 as a barracks for as many as a thousand soldiers of the tower garrison. It now houses the jewel house, and that's where you're gonna to go to visit our state crown jewels, and what a sight they are. If you haven't done it already, it is a must on your agenda today. Make sure you do do the crown jewels before you leave the tower today. I would go on forever, but seeing is believing. Make sure you do it today. Right, very quickly, right down the bottom there, that last building there, that's the headquarters 
of the Royal Regiment of Fusiliers. Now that's an old infantry regiment that was formed here at the tower in 1685. Not only is it their headquarters though, they also have a very small museum within that building. You are more than welcome to visit that museum. Right then, let's get your attention back here. <coughs> <laughs> I want to talk about the executions. <laughs> One more. Yeah. And like I said, there were very few within these walls. Three of them, they were queens of England. And the first of those was on the 19th of May, 1536, and was Queen Anne Boleyn. She'd been tried on questionable charges of incest, adultery, even witchcraft. But her execution was not by the axe. She feared greatly, but it was done in the French manner, using a two-handed sword. Her last words on the execution site, as he wielded that sword, Lord God, have pity on my miserable soul. A prayer that she said over and over again. Now, the executioner, a professional, brought over from Calais, France, especially for this task, and he did the task so professionally when he lifted her head to declare the traitor, it was recorded that her eyes were still moving in their sockets. And her lips were still moving with that prayer. <laughs> now that last little bit you saw there, um, those tours are given by what they call the beef eaters, which are the guards and those are uh, well worth taking the bits of humor mixed in with uh, a lot of good fact and uh, history behind the, the tower. So if you get a chance and you go in, make sure you catch one of those. And they also do reenactments as you see here. Uh, great for the kids. Uh, they put on a good show and uh, try to get some involvement from the crowd. Well worth seeing. So while you're here, check this out. And uh, also make sure you swing by the uh, the other side, which uh, has the crown jewels, the queen's uh, crown, and a lot of other stuff uh, they have on a display as uh, well here inside the Tower of London. All right, and with that, this has been a long video, so I'll wrap it up here. And uh, check this out if you get a chance. <laughs>